Welcome tonight. Great to have um, all of you on, especially our speakers, but want to say a special welcome to members of our Duke Fuqua, UNC Keenan Flagler, and SMU Cox chapters who have uh, hosted this evening's conversation. Um, a little bit about the Adam Smith Society, if you're not familiar. We are a chapter-based organization of free market-minded business leaders located at business schools around the country with a national network of professionals in cities around the country and abroad. Um, I highly encourage you to join today if you're not already a member. You can reach out to myself or your chapter leaders um, if you're interested in hearing about membership. And just a quick plug, that national meeting is right around the corner, and we will be launching a registration for national meeting next Wednesday, so keep your eye out for that. Um, a few remarks about the format for this evening's debate. We will get started with about 30 minutes of discussion and debate, debate followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. The way we run our Q&A at the Adam Smith Society is we ask that you will submit your questions via the chat function throughout the broadcast. So whenever something comes to you that you'd like to ask our esteemed speakers, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, at the end of the discussion portion, we will I will then um, ask individuals to come on screen and ask the questions directly of the speakers themselves. I'll send you a direct message if you've been queued up um, so that you're prepared, but we really like the opportunity we want to give you all the opportunity to speak to these individuals the same way you would have if uh, we were in person. Um, today's event will be recorded. Uh, it's seldom that, or I mean, it is, we do have it, we do have great speakers all the time, but we have some really wonderful speakers on this evening. So want to make sure that um, as many members of the network are able to have access to their insight as possible. So a little bit about our speakers this evening. Our um, discussion will be moderated by Steve Lohr, an award-winning New York Times journalist. Um, he is an award winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Tonight, we will have two speakers. Um, first, Dr. Robert Atkinson is president of the Information Technology Innovation Foundation, the world's top think tank for science and technology policy. Dr. Atkinson has testified numerous times before Congress and written extensively on competitiveness in the market and how big tech has emerged as an advanced industry that helps drive U.S. competitiveness, innovation, job creation, and economic growth. Dr. Francis Frank Fukuyama is the Oliver Normellini Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, Morbash uh, I'm so sorry, I am not doing the best job. Uh, direct, um, director of FSI's Center of Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, and is director of Stanford's Master's in Internationally Pol International Policy Program. Dr. Fukuyama is a principal investigator for the Program on Democracy and the Internet in partnership with the Stanford Cyber, Cyber Policy Center and Stanford Law School. He's, he has recently published report focuses on various harms of dominant technology platforms, including economic threats and threats to democracy. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Steve, who will be moderating this evening's discussion. Thanks, Steve. My role here is to uh, kind of start to frame things and get the ball rolling, so we'll do that. I, um, I think how you address these issues uh, is critically determined by how you define them and then what you think should be done or shouldn't. So let's start out with, with Frank, if we can. Um, Frank, what's, you know, what is the big tech problem of today? And, and why is it different than tech dominance eras and companies we've been concerned about in the past, like Microsoft in the 90s and uh, IBM from the late 60s to the early 80s? What's different this time? Well, uh, sure. See, so, you know, the generic problem, I think, is just scale because uh, the big tech platforms are, you know, the largest companies anywhere in the world. Uh, and economic power basically uh, adds up to uh, not just economic dominance, but political power uh, as well. Uh, and I think that, you know, for that reason, antitrust, uh, ever since the Sherman Act, has been of concern, although it's not been terribly well enforced. Um, since the 1980s, uh, I think that you've got to distinguish between economic harms and uh, political harms. My group uh, actually started out as a Stanford work working group on uh, antitrust, but we decided early on that actually antitrust was a too narrow framing of the issue. Uh, antitrust, especially the way that law has developed in the United States, really focuses on economic 
harms like exclusionary practices, monopoly, you know, tying, vertical tying, all these sorts of things. And I think that while they um, uh, may indeed be uh, abuses going on, uh, it seemed to us that the real problem was the political side because the big platforms have in effect become the uh, platforms for political speech. And over the years, they have been uh, curating content uh, related to you know, public discussions of uh, public issues in the United States. And um, I think that role has been very problematic because of their incentive structure. I mean, they don't have a specific political agenda. They want to make money. But the way that a big platform makes money is through virality and clicks. And as a result, they've tended to emphasize uh, you know, content that is salacious or conspiratorial or you know, uncivil. Uh, and I think a lot of people have concluded that that's you know, been a fairly big contributor to the polarization and the kind of decline of uh, you know, civility and, um, uh, you know, uh, ability of a, a democracy to actually uh, reach uh, a common, you know, a, a viewpoint in deliberation. Uh, and so I think that that's really the issue is the ability of the big platforms to either artificially uh, amplify or silence uh, certain political voices. And I think that there's nothing in democratic theory that says that they've got the legitimacy to do this. They don't have the capacity. And by the way, this is not just an American problem. You know, they're making decisions in India, in Myanmar, in Ukraine, and all sorts of countries around the world that affect their internal democratic uh, deliberations. They don't really understand the politics of any of these places, and yet they're acting uh, as gatekeepers. Uh, but I think more importantly is a, uh, is a problem of legitimacy. These are private companies controlled, you know, in my, uh, Facebook's case, uh, largely by one individual. Uh, and in a democracy, there's nothing that gives that individual, you know, that uh, a right to have that degree of control over uh, political speech. So I would say that that is the, you know, that political problem is the one that I would uh, focus on. Rob, do you... What's your take on, on Frank's framing of this? That is, we have, you know, the traditional economics antitrust issues of innovation and competitiveness, but beyond that, this power more broadly defined, it, rather than pure marketplace power, but po the power to shape and steer uh, conversations and affect political attitudes um, and, and opinions. Um, what's, you know, what's your take on that framing? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't agree with Frank's point that these are unprecedented in size. If you go back and look at other periods of history, there have been firms that if you take their market capitalization, that it's bigger share of GDP than what the tech firms are today. So they're not enormously big compared to our history. We've always had large firms ever since the uh, early 1900s. Um, secondly, it's good those firms are large. And, and to Frank's credit, the report, the Stanford report that he led makes that point. There are network effects, there are scale effects that are going to lead these firms to be big. That's what the Obama White House said. Uh, if we break up Facebook into two things, we have Facebook and we have Headbook, eventually it goes back to Facebook. There's a reason why uh, network effects make it easier for people to do these things. Um, secondly, um, there are so many benefits that are coming from these firms right now. What was something everybody just ignores, but frankly, if you look at the top five tech firms, they spend more on R&D every year, almost as much, like a billion dollars less than the entire R&D budget of the UK, public and private combined. I mean, these, you know, Steve, you, you know this literature very well, that, you know, this critique against American firms, short term, just looking for profits, you know, not willing to go for market share, not willing to invest in the long run. Now we have a bunch of firms that are actually doing the opposite. Uh, they're investing for the long run. And who, the reason we have autonomous vehicles is because of Google. All the other players would have been much later in that process. So what I do think is different, though, and that's really what Frank's report was about. You know, when IBM controlled the, the mainframe market, they, they didn't control the information on it. They controlled the tool, whereas these firms have control of information. So I do think that there's a legitimate concern about that. These firms could do something. Where I disagree with Frank is... Number one, I don't think these firms are going to, he uses the analogy of a loaded gun. Anytime one of those firms wants to pull, pull the trigger, uh, 
number one, they'll probably go out of business because of the uproar. Number two, there'll be an immediate congressional investigation. And number three, there'll probably be massive regulation. Uh, so there are lots and lots of constraints on these firms. They're not just sitting back. They're going all, you know, they're like Dr. Evil, you know, ooh, I'm going to do these things. They're just, there are constraints on them. And that's not to say that the system's perfect. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say, I know, I know Frank has an innovative idea around middleware. Um, that's, I think, an interesting idea. I don't agree with it, but it's an interesting idea in the sense of, I, I agree with Frank, Antitrust is not the solution to the speech issues here. There, there. Are, it's a different question than antitrust can handle. We actually so, have a quote in our. I think it survived in our report uh, that was written in the 1980s, that made uh, an argument similar to Rob's that you know if a commercial company uh, tried to get and get too political and and try to shape opinion too much it would lose uh, readership or viewership and, and basically go out of business, uh, which is a little bit uh, amusing to read uh, in the uh, hindsight of Fox News and the success that it's had. Uh, so it's not really clear to me that, uh, you know, a firm, uh, especially a media firm getting political is going to be a death sentence in economic terms. Well, to be fair, though, Fox is, 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 is a niche you know, it's it it said, hey, there's we're going to segment this market. It, you know, it's not CBS, which was the market. It was going after the entire U.S. market, right to left. Fox is going after that. You look at a company like Google or Facebook; they're not a segmented company. They're not segmenting the market. They're trying to go after everybody in the market. Now, Parler, uh, as as a Twitter alternative, sure, they're segmented, but the the big companies are not trying to segment the market. So, they get in real trouble if they start to you know, hive off 30, 20, 30, 40% of their market because people don't like them. Frank, on, on this, uh, let, let me go back to Rob on this, or both of you on this. Let's, I'm just from an antitrust standpoint, neither one of you wants to break up these guys. You don't think that's a solution? Well, I, I agree with Rob that because of the uh, uh, network economies, uh, it's probably hope. I mean, the first, you know, there's a practical issue, which is just that it'll take at least 10 years to work your way through one of these big antitrust suits. That's what it took in AT&T's case and IBM and Microsoft, because they're very, very complicated and you're gonna be hiring an entire generation of lawyers to litigate the thing. But I do agree that uh, it's probably not gonna do any good because I think a baby Facebook would grow to the size of the parent Facebook and it'll do it much much more quickly than AT&T you know, eventually came back to dominate the, the telecoms market. Uh, so that's why I think, uh, although in theory, you know, breaking up these companies might solve some of the political problems, it's just not a practical solution. Let's get to the sort of your, your middleware issue a little bit later, if we could. But let me ask you this, Frank, given your background, um, uh, you know, why not on the issues that so many people are concerned about, you know, things like misinformation and, and certain kinds of speech that people find objectionable, you know, kind of what's wrong with just a free market in speech? That is, you know, anybody's dumb enough to believe it deserves it. And, uh, and yeah, and that's the argument. Uh, you know, the classic uh, sort of Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, defense of free speech was basically this market defense that uh, rather than trying to limit speech, uh, uh, if everybody gets to speak, uh, good ideas will eventually drive out bad ideas. and you'll arrive at you know, some nice uh, 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 form of democratic deliberation. And I think you know, that was plausible in earlier phases of technology, but you know, the problem with internet mediated uh, speech is that it operates at a scale and with a speed that no one has ever seen in human history. I mean, a bad idea, you know, a conspiracy theory can get you know, tens of millions of followers in a matter of hours. And this is a situation that is really pretty um, uh, unprecedented. And that's why the ability to amplify that these big platforms have is really, I think, something that's quite dangerous to the possibility of uh, democratic deliberation. Yeah, and the concern, there, of course, cuts both ways. I mean, you know, the, um, the, the view of the right is that Facebook is, you know, absolutely liberal and, and a, le a bunch of lefties. And then if you look at the top 10 list every day on Facebook and the things that are most popular, it's all mostly all right. 
you know, or predominantly. So, I mean, you know, both sides played this pretty well. Let's, let's go to a little bit of this history with you, Frank, on this, this evolution of this, uh, you know, middleware notion. Um, you know, where did the idea come from? Why do you think this sort of approach uh, makes sense? And just give it a give us a flavor of how it might work. Yeah, well, sure. So let me first of all explain what it is. So middleware would be software that sits between the big platform and the user. And there's different ways you could implement it. And we don't really recommend either a heavy version or a light version. At one ex extreme, it could take over the entire Facebook or Google uh, interface and basically treat the platform as a dumb pipe and, and serve up uh, something that is based on what the user wants. Or it could take a lighter form. There's a company called NewsGuard, for example, that rates the credibility uh, of different uh, news uh, sources. And it's sort of like what Twitter was doing uh, during the election campaign. It's just putting little check marks, you know, saying this is questionable information. And that's kind of the light version. But the main uh, idea is that right now, what you see in your Google search, in your news feed, on uh, uh, Facebook, on you know the rankings uh, of the things that you see on the platforms, all of that is determined by an algorithm uh, that is completely non-transparent. You have no idea. You can kind of guess why they're showing you certain things, but you really don't know. And you know, more importantly, as a user, you have no uh, control over it. And so our idea, uh, which was actually uh, invented by my colleague, he's a computer scientist, Ashish Goel at uh, Stanford, is to essentially outsource this content curation uh, to a layer of competitive companies. And so if you want a certain kind of news feed, you go to a middleware provider that allows you to change the knobs and dials and have your feed uh, do what you want it to. So, you know, you could imagine it like in an Amazon search. Let's say you want to buy only American made products or you want to buy only environmentally sustainable products. Uh, you could have a middleware company that, you know, that, that uh, provides you that. Or let's say you're a consortium of universities and you want students and faculty to have access to academically, you know, reliable uh, sources. They could, uh, you know, create a, a nonprofit that would, in effect, provide that uh, that kind of service. Of course, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you know, uh, if, uh, if you're an alt right person and you don't want to hear any of this liberal claptrap, uh, you know, you could have your own provider. But I think this is uh, the politically important point. I do think that there is a certain feeling out there among digital activists that. The point of public policy actually ought to be to drive conspiracy theories and hate speech off of the internet, you know, completely. And in my view, that's not a legitimate goal of public policy. You know, our First Amendment guarantees a right of speech, including the right to say ridiculous things or hateful things, or, you know, I mean, basically the only limitations are things like inciting, actively inciting violence. Uh, and I think that we have to take that seriously. And for that reason, uh, although I was quite happy when Twitter kicked Donald Trump off. I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you, it's been a pleasure not to have to, you know, yeah, follow his, his feet every day. Uh, you know, so I think, and especially after January 6th, I think it was, you know, it was, a, it was an okay act. But in a democracy, I don't think that's a sustainable solution. You cannot delegate to a private... Uh, profit-making company, that kind of political responsibility. And I think the extent to which Twitter has silenced Trump since uh, January 8th or whenever he was kicked off just you know, gives you some sense of how powerful they are. Uh, so that's something that I think we really need to think more deeply about as a democracy. And I, you know, you've got plenty of company there, Angela Merkel, right? For however much she didn't like Trump, right? Was one of the people who thought that was a bad idea to toss him yeah. off with her. Yeah. Um, Rob, I mean, you got, this is, you know, like it or not, political economics are political. <laughs> um, and this is a big focus of concern um, with the, uh, you know, over these tech platforms, particularly obviously Facebook, you know, um, Twitter to, to some degree, obviously, and uh, and 
uh, YouTube, uh, Google's the YouTube. Um, do you have a view on, on, you know, on what should be done? And, and do you have a critique of Frank's, sure. you know, proposed solution? So I think one of the things that we have to do to understand this is sort of go back to square one. You know, the internet was designed with open protocols. <clears throat> and I don't know when, <clears throat> early 2000s, Web 2.0 came about. If people remember what that was, it was basically that you can post something. Before that, you were a consumer. Web 1.0 was you were a consumer. Once we got to Web 2.0, this was basically going to happen. I mean, knuckleheads could put whatever they wanted to on the internet and, and it could be seen. And so there was going to be a Twitter. It didn't, you know, it didn't matter. Somebody was going to do that. There was going to be a Facebook. There was going to be a search engine. There was going to be a video platform. These are just obvious. Now there's going to be audio platforms. There's nothing you can do about that unless you want to completely shut down uh, Web 2.0 and completely fundamentally change the internet architecture. So that's very important to remember to say that these companies are causing this. No, it's, it's the underlying technology. It's, it's sort of like saying GM was responsible for car accidents. Uh, no, the invention of the car was responsible for car accidents. Now we, 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 we had seat belts, we had airbags. Oh, right? I don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to come to the what, what, you, what we should do. But, you know, the idea, so here's my, here's my problem with Frank's proposal, this middleware proposal, two, two problems. One, right now there's an asymmetry in here because the right hates these companies because they take off too much. The left hates these companies because they don't take off enough. I mean, that's just the reality though. Nobody's really complaining about left-wing voices getting taken down. So all the, all the liberals want more stuff taken down and all the conservatives want less stuff taken down. The problem with the middleware solution is it still will give companies the ability to take things down unless you ban that, which I don't see how you can. And then what it does is everything that's up there, you have this middleware filter that then you can then interrogate and put in your preferences and it gives you that. So if you're a, if you're a liberal, this is great. Uh, the platforms still take the conservative stuff off, and now I got all these groups that are going to label the heck out of everything, so that everybody knows that something that we don't like is going to be labeled. So that, that's that's number one. Number two is, you know, I'm on the content advisory board of TikTok with a bunch of other people who know a lot more about content uh, uh, issues around kids and psychology than I do. But I got to tell you. And I'm not saying just them, because they all do this. The company spends an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of time trying to keep hate speech and uh, all sorts. I mean, there's a whole litany of things that we've gone through on that. You know, you, you can't, you know, promote drug use. You, you, you can't say anti-Semitic things, you know, all the things that you would expect. And they really, really work hard at it. They have an algorithm that helps. And they also have people can report it, but they pay I don't know how many people, it's a lot of people. They spend a lot of money on people to look at each one and then have to make a judgment call. And then there's, a, there's ways to sort of adjudicate that. I just don't think the business model works at all with having these third parties do that. It's not like these third party can gin up some algorithm and oh, let's apply the algorithm. Algorithms don't work well enough. They help, but you have to have bodies. Those bodies cost a lot of money. So I don't think the business model works. And the last point I'll make, I can say more about this, but the last point I'll make is I think it would be, I think it would be really, really bad to have these companies be dumb pipes. I mean, why do people like TikTok? It's because they don't just randomly serve up every video that just came on. Oh, that was a millisecond ago. I'm going to see that. They, the algorithm tailors it to what I think I like. And I'm, I'm happy for that, as are 99.9% .9 of the people in the world. So the idea that and Google, I mean, Google is not a dumb pipe. Google isn't like, I'm going to randomly go out there on my, my spider crawls. I'm going to randomly give you a website. The reason Google won, the reason it, it beat everybody else is its algorithm, its way of customizing that. And what I saw in that report was, oh, that's somehow bad because it gives them power. Well, the alternative, you can't, the alternative is, is just stupid pipes. I'm not saying the alternative is stupid. The alternative is just the pipe becomes stupid and then there's no real sort of value to the consumer. So I, I, I don't think the middleware solution works. You know, I'll let Frank respond, but I'm happy to sort of tell you then what I think the answer should be, but I don't think it's middleware. Yeah, I mean, I agree that actually uh, the platforms really do a lot of content curation. Steve, you haven't brought up section 230 yet. I was about to, that's later. Yeah, I mean, that, that <laughs> We're was, not done uh, with middleware yet. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Republicans' fam, uh, favorite um, 
a solution to this problem, which I don't think is a solution at all because they have to do content uh, uh, curation. I mean, if they weren't, you know, filtering out, um, you know, child pornography and, uh, you know, bullying, I mean, there's just a ton of things that uh, exist in this sewer called the internet uh, that they already uh, take out. Uh, and if they get gun shy about their ability to do that, uh, you know, people are really going to have a problem with uh, the stuff they see. And so I just don't think that that's a solution. Uh, I wasn't recommending that we turn these companies into dumb pipes, but I do think that uh, it is possible to add on a layer uh, of curation that will uh, basically take the responsibility for filtering political speech away from the platforms. Jack Dorsey on several occasions has said that he would like nothing better than to not have to make these decisions about whether Donald Trump you know, goes or stays. Uh, you know, this is before this, uh, uh, this um, uh, Facebook review panel right now about whether they're gonna keep the ban on Trump uh, on Facebook. And you know, believe me, I mean, from the standpoint of any of the people that run these companies, they would rather have somebody else make that decision rather than have to get in the crosshairs of the current polarization uh, in American politics. So I'm not uh, suggesting that they turn into dumb pipes. They'll continue to have to do content moderation. But I think with regard to you know, this kind of political speech, uh, they would be able to actually step away from that function uh, if it can be turned over to a competitive layer of company. Now, the business model part is a different question and we can get to that. Uh, Thank you, Steve. I was going to just have you, you know, you are in the high seat of high tech. I mean, have you run this proposal by, uh, you know, any of the big tech companies been in touch with you or uh, uh, so any we, of your computer science people taking it to them? And, and is it too early for a reaction or? Uh, so we've not run it by any of the platforms themselves uh, because I think they're just really, you know, they're really of two minds because on the one hand, they would like to get rid of this curation function as it relates to politics. On the other hand, um, it could very deeply eat into their business models if it's carried too far. And I think they'd actually be more worried about, uh, you know, about that. And so we've not gotten much of a reaction. We have run it you know, past various entrepreneurs and VCs and people that invest in this sector. And there are a number of people that think you could actually make um, uh, money or there, there would be a solution that would make this uh, uh, economically viable and, you know, a fair amount of, you know, enthusiasm for the underlying idea uh, of outsourcing content curation. And Frank, you would, I mean, your, your model doesn't necessarily hurt their business model unless it hurts volume. I mean, you're not, you, you're not opposed to targeted advertising. You're, you're, you're yeah, suggesting yeah, a filter right. on political content. It would, it would uh, yeah. it was a third, so he, third party intermediary. Handling. It might actually help their business model because uh, right now a lot of conservatives are mad at Twitter and Facebook, you know, for their decisions about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But if they could stand back and say, no, we're okay, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, it's up to these middleware companies to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, you know, it would take them out of the crosshairs of, uh, you know, of people. I, I guess the other thing to think about is it, it's, it really gets down to basic democratic theory. I mean, it's true right now uh, that the people that run Google, Facebook, and Twitter, you know, tend to be, uh, at least on social issues, fairly uh, liberal. But when you're designing a democratic institution, you can't rely on, you know, the good intentions of the current power holders to support your democracy. Because you know, tomorrow you could be a you know a, a Julian Sinclair uh, or a Rupert Murdoch that buys you know one of these big platforms and pushes it in you know the opposite political direction, and I don't want that to happen uh, either. Uh, so I do think that we have to have a policy that is neutral with regard to who we think is actually running these companies right now that will be able to survive, you know, market turmoil and changes in political opinion uh, uh, and, and not rely on the good intentions of, you know, particular individuals. 
let me ask, since you brought up uh, Section 230, uh, which is the section, the portion of this 1996 Communications Decency Act that basically gives, you know, uh, a liability shield to the platforms. And I know, Rob, your 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 foundation has has a suggestion on this that is not totally hands off. Um, what's what's the smart thing, Rob? Do you think should be done uh, with Section 230? Yeah, well, I, I'm happy to say I just want to respond to something Frank said, which is that they didn't talk about neutral pipe. Actually, the report says, quote, the underlying platform serves as little more than a neutral pipe. That sounds under like one a solution, yeah, under, okay, under the that, heavy that, version, yeah. All right. The second problem with it, this is the Adam Smith Society. We should remember that. Um, this, this middleware version, by the way, I, these companies are free to do middleware now, and nothing's stopping them. If they really want to get out from under this burden, they can do it. But what this proposal would really talks about is mandating it, having a, a federal mandate that they have to do it, including revenue sharing. So if you think about that for a moment, we're now talking, we're now talking price controls. We're now talking regulated telephone monopoly. We're saying this is the amount of revenue you can get from ads, Google, and you got to share 18% of it with this company or whatever it might be. That's a huge step. Now, I just don't think that's the answer. With regard to 230, Steve, I think there's really two issues. Uh, just, just to be fair, Rob, I mean, Google has a lot of revenue sharing already, right? Well, they do do revenue sharing, but, but it's volunteer. Depending on who, who brought in the ads and that sort of thing, it's, you know, it's, that, it's, vol it's part, part of the It's option. voluntary. It's market-based. So it's two parties negotiating uh, what, what the share is. Well, I don't know. If, I, if, I'm, adver if I'm advertising, <laughs> I, if I want to pay for search ads, I'm not sure that, you know, right? I mean, it's, yes, it's market-based, but it's Google's market. Well, right? I, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because the, the core issue in antitrust is the first thing you do is you define the market. And everybody here, define, most everybody is defining the market as the social media market, the search engine market, the, the Twitter market, that's not the market, okay? That's, that's on the consumer side, it's just an eyeball market. All these companies are competing for exactly the same thing, which is my eyeball and my attention. The real market- uh, With others, I'd give you that, but I mean, you know, the, this notion that everything is just a click away is exactly the Microsoft argument made that everything was, you know, every, every mainframe, every computing device was competition with them as opposed to defining the market as the personal computer operating system. And that went nowhere. I mean, you might as well just burn thousand dollar bills for, you know, expert witnesses. It's, I don't, I, I think defining search advertising and search, if, if it comes to an antitrust case is gonna be awkward. So Steve, you, you lived through that Microsoft case. You were there every day. So you were- It was Monty, who was the-, the, the yeah. uh, so the I don't disagree. MIT Sloan School, and you know he was defenseless, basically. I don't disagree with you on search. I'm talking. So I, you know, we're in a quick conversation, so I got to yeah, cut yeah. things short. Search is, I agree. Search, search is a little bit different. It's, it, but but you you do you do have Bing. You have some others. But the other ones, which are people talk about YouTube, social media, you know, TikTok, all those, Twitter, that's all sort of one big market. That that was that was my point. But. Okay. Yeah, so and I just don't, I don't think there's a big antitrust issue there. The, the antitrust issue really to me is not, should not be about how much market share they have. It's just, you know, Google, Google gained its market share with mostly legitimate means. The issue is really, is there anti-competitive conduct? And the report sort of talks about that and says, oh, these big firms, they raise these questions. You know, so what? Any firm raises those questions. And that's why we have antitrust laws. That's why we have antitrust regulators. We bring cases against firms, as as the DOJ has done, uh, and those are cases that should be decided in court, not by a bunch of think tanks. Uh, so, what what should we do on two thirty? The two thirty is really partly related to this notion of um, I think there's two parts of it. There are certain things that are illegal, and they have to take them. They don't have two thirty um, immunity when their issues are illegal. So, one answer is make things make more things illegal. For example, we've called for a uh, a revenge porn national law. There's revenge porn uh, local law, state laws, but there's no national law for revenge porn. It should be it should be uh, against the law. If it's against the law, all the platforms have to aggressively deal with it. But on 230 in political speech, I think the answer is not is is not sort of going is not going to the middleware solution. It's going to some intermediary body solution in the sense of should Twitter take down Trump? Well, who, I agree with Frank. Ultimately, that's a societal question. Society has to decide that. 
and I don't think Twitter can, nor does Twitter want to, but we've never sort of been in that situation before. So my initial solution would be, you know, some sort of national commission that I'm not saying looks at each individual case, but sets overarching guidelines, overarching frameworks. These are the sorts of things you can and cannot do in political speech. I don't, I don't One think last thing. If it was up to me, you could never take a president down. That, I just think, doesn't matter what the president, he's the, he or she is the president. But that's my opinion. We can decide that as a society. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a workable solution given uh, the state of our politics right now. I mean, uh, you know, we used to have something called the fairness doctrine uh, that came out of the original. Uh, uh, I was going to bring that one up too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was its constitutionality, you know, with the First Amendment was upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1960s. And, you know, they regulated speech in the sense of requiring uh, media companies to post opposing opinions and the like. Uh, the Republicans hated this because they thought that this was biased against conservatives uh, and they fought relentlessly to um, uh, get it rescinded, which it was in 1987. Uh, and I just think that, you know, compared to 1987, our politics is so much more polarized and so much more bitter today that the idea that you could actually arrive at some kind of a, a social institutional consensus that would have the FCC telling uh, these platforms what is acceptable content moderation is just, it's hopeless. Uh, it's not gonna happen. You can do that in Europe right now because you know, in Germany and Scandinavia and you know, some other European countries, there's enough of a social consensus left that they can decide on these kinds of regulatory uh, uh, boundaries to put around uh, online speech, but I, don't, I just don't think we can do it here. And that's one of the reasons that I think, uh, and by the way, uh, this is probably why I'm not a member of the Adam Smith Society. I don't have a big problem with the government regulating the sector because I think it's actually politically uh, important enough. And that is one of the functions of government. I'm not actually quite sure that Adam Smith himself would have been so opposed to the idea of uh, state intervention uh, in uh, in this case, but as a practical matter, I just I just don't see it happening right now. I, I would just first of all to clarify, Frank, I am not at all, nor I would be the last person to argue that the FCC should be setting those standards. I think it should be some sort of public-private partnership where these companies would come together in a self-regulatory body and say, and, and and I'm not even arguing that we need to say this sort of thing or that. I'm just saying certain baseline rules. Do you get to do you get to kick off a mayor? Yeah, probably. You get to kick off the Senate Majority Leader. No. Those sorts of things, I think, would, would go a long, long way in terms of helping. I, I just don't, I don't think the, I don't think the middleware solution works from a business model perspective. And the other challenge, I think, with it is, I mean, you mentioned, well, you could have a consortium of universities decide which content they like, because then it would be objective. I don't know maybe Stanford is one of those few universities where the faculty are completely objective, but I don't see that happening. I would see that as a hotbed of politicization. I mean, talk about not being able to agree. And the other thing, I think the key point, Frank, is the reason we have political disagreements like we have is not because of these platforms. It's because we have two, you know, radically different views of what this country should be. That's the issue. It's not somehow that people are deluded yeah. by being on Facebook. Oh, geez, if it wasn't for Facebook, I wouldn't have bought into all of this right wing crap or all this left wing wokeness. Those are real things. I'm yeah. not so sure about that. You know, I this is a kind of a typical, really hard social science problem to figure out the causality there. And my initial inclination was like yours to say, well, these are divisions that exist within society. Uh, as a whole, and the platforms are simply reflecting those divisions. But I'm not so sure anymore that that's really the case, because there's a lot of bad things that have correlated, you know, precisely with the uh, the growth of, uh, you know, platform power. I mean, things not related even to political speech, you know, the number of teen suicides uh, has gone up dramatically when teens began to use social media very uh, intensively and could compare themselves instantaneously, you know, whether they're thin enough or beautiful enough uh, or whatnot. Uh, and so I do think that, uh, you know, the causality, I, nobody's saying that 
we're only polarized because of these uh, platforms. But I do think that there's some reason for thinking that causality goes in both directions, that they both reflect our polarization, but they also contribute to it. Well, I just say, well, and I wish I could remember the study, but ITIF issued a report, I believe early last year called Understanding the Tech Lash. And it looked at about 18 or 20 different criticisms of, of large technology platforms, including things like teen you know, suicide or health problems, including things like polarization and filter bubbles. And as I recall, the academic scholarly evidence didn't didn't hold up. I mean, if you think about all the things kids can do now, young people, I have, I have a teenager, that, you know, if you were, if you felt that you had a different sexual orientation 30 years ago, or you were confused, you had no options. Now you can go online, you can find a community, you can learn about it. So, you know, the idea that it's, that's the other thing that drives me crazy about this entire debate. We're missing the enormous benefits that these platforms provide. You know, people just, you know, you, you can have a community now. If you, if you live in a, in, in a town where nobody thinks like you, you can find a community now. And you couldn't do that 40 years ago, or it was a lot harder. Yeah, I think, you know, this is to Frank's point somewhat as well. I mean, this is both the good and the bad. It's, you know, it amplifies everything. And it's the basic point of about computing is, you know, is that, and physics is that, you know, at some point quantitative changes become qualitative, right? And they really do kind of change things. And I think it's probably, you know, true on both sides of it. And as far as the big tech companies go, that's fine. But I mean, you know, all of the criticism has been at the margin in a way. I mean, just watch the quarterly earnings. <laughs> You know, and their numbers of joining. I mean, the problem with Frank's proposal in a lot of ways is you could have these, you know, you know, independent fact-checking kind of alerts on the side, and you know, people are still so polarized they wouldn't care. They would care less, right? And, and, you know, and you could find that out with some A/B testing, right? You know, just to see if it would make a difference. So I think there's, you know, you know, I, both sides I think have you know kind of a lot of common ground here. I think we're moving towards, we've got you know, time for a little bit more before we're, we're supposed to have a, at least a few questions at the end. Um, so look, let me ask you this, Rob, sir. You know, in this trend, we are, it is global. China has joined the antitrust thing, you know, going after big tech, all different reasons for all these places. But you know, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, the United States, in some ways, at least of it. I mean, what, what concerns you about this effort to rein in tech power? Yeah, well, first of all, China, you know, you, you never really believe what China does because they're, they're everything in China is political. The reason China is going after big tech is not antitrust reasons. It's power. It, it's that's all it is. It's basically to tell Jack Ma and those types of people you are under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party, and you can never forget that. That's what's going on there. That's and I hope frankly, that that's not what's going on here. I mean, we should have a rule of law with regard to that. What really worries me, I mean, look, I, in, in this book I wrote with my colleague, Mike Lynn, Big is Beautiful, uh, for MIT Press, uh, debunking the myth of small, but we went back and looked at a lot of the antitrust history in the US, and you and I have talked about that. I just finished James Cortada's book on IBM, fantastic book. Antitrust really, really hurt IBM. Mm -hmm. Antitrust really, really hurt and, and killed the, the U.S. color television industry when we broke up, when we took all the patents away from RCA. Uh, I wrote a, a long piece on who lost Lucent. And we used to have Lucent, which was the world's leading telecom equipment player. It was that dead. It was a long history of antitrust aggression against that company. That was the principal reason Lucent was so weakened. So that's what worries me about this. We, we finally have these companies that are, some companies that are successful, they invest in R&D. I mean, think about all the R&D, autonomous systems, uh, robots, uh, you know, all this AI, all this stuff, it's amazing. You know, who, why is the US the leader in AI, AI? Why are we way ahead of China and Europe? It's because of these companies. Why are these companies doing it? Because they have Schumpeterian profits, if you will. They're able to put all that money into the future. Now, if these, if these were sort of just monopolies that were sucking out the money and giving it to their shareholders. Yeah, I'd, I'd be a lot more sympathetic, but these are Schumpeterian monopolies, if you will, that are investing for the future. So my view is that's great. I wanna see more of it. I'd like to see more of them, not less of them. Frank, what's your concern? I suggest, I assume it's a little different. 
Yeah, well, as I said, I mean, I'm focused on the political consequences of these companies, but, you know, if you want to just stick to the economic consequences, uh, yes, they are uh, large because they're efficient and they do certain things very well, but, uh, you know, there's this book uh, by Thomas Philippon at NYU that came out last year that shows that compared to the situation 20 years ago, consumer prices in the United States are across the board uh, higher than they were in Europe. And that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Uh, and his argument is that uh, it's not just in tech, but in many other sectors, in pharmaceuticals, in hospitals, uh, in uh, airlines, uh, because, you know, and, and by the way, there's a history to this. Uh, it wasn't like we always had the same kind of antitrust uh, enforcement. This really began, you know, with these University of Chicago uh, types uh, like Robert Bork and George Stigler uh, back in the 19, uh, late 70s and early 80s, uh, uh, Aaron Director and so forth, that, you know, basically made the argument uh, that Rob is making, that the only reason these companies are big is because they're very efficient. And I think that might have been an appropriate argument, uh, but I think it just got carried too far. Uh, and we have an entire generation of uh, jurists, you know, judges uh, on federal benches and lawyers that have absorbed all of those uh, those ideas. And that's why we've had such uh, relaxed antitrust enforcement. Uh, Rob made the comment that uh, it's better hashing this out in the judiciary rather than in think tanks. Well, actually, the reason that we got to the place we are started with this think tank called the University of Chicago Economics Department. Uh, that then, you know, um, pushed the entire uh, federal bench onto this, you know, uh, acceptance of, you know, the consumer welfare standard and a lot of other ideas that actually came out of a think tank. And I would just say that we need a different kind of think tank because, you know, it wasn't that all these ideas were terrible, but I just think you can carry a, a good thing too far. And I think we've done that in this country. So if I could just run, by the way, I, I don't, I think think tanks are one of the most important institutions in the world because I run one, <laughs> but um, okay. I don't think, I don't think I should be deciding uh, cases because I don't know enough to decide the Google case, for example, that was, I was saying judges should decide cases. My point uh, to, to your point, Frank, about this, the Philippon book is just chock full of errors. I mean, it's just unbelievable how many errors there are in it, including the pricing notion that you have when you go back and actually look at the markup what he calls markups. There's no evidence of markups that have gone up. He, what he does is he fails to account for what are called intangible capital. So it looks like markups went up, but companies have more intangible capital. If his theory is correct, U.S. profits should be higher. U.S. profits are lower than the domestic profits, I should say. Domestic non-financial profits uh, are lower than they were in the 1960s. They're about on average of what they were for the last 30 years. So the 60s was, by the way, before the Bork Revolution, the Chicago Revolution. And it was when we had cases like Brown Shoe. Uh, I don't know, Steve, you know that case where uh, the antitrust was going against two shoe companies where if they merged their combined market share would have been something like 13%. Are you kidding me? So that was where we came from. Now, maybe we've gone a little too far uh, with Chicago, and I, I, I'm kind of in, in the kind of California school a little bit with uh, some of my colleagues there. But the idea is somehow that we have a monopoly problem. Airline, just a quick thing on airlines. I wrote a piece on that recently. But you better make it quick though, Rob. We're, right. we're winding down here. We have to Last 15 have years, questions. airline prices have gone up less than the CPI. Their average profits are lower than, their profits are lower than the average profits. They've invested more in capital expenditures. And uh, on every measure you would look at, Airlines are a success story. They're not a monopoly problem. So we have to look at the evidence before we just say, oh yeah, we have a monopoly problem. Okay, I think we're kicking it back to Kate here. I, mean, it's, uh, I think we have a few questions from uh, the Adam Smith Society. Yeah, so I just wanna thank you gentlemen, first and foremost so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. So the first person I'm gonna bring on here is Oliver Field from our Duke chapter. And Oliver, I'll just ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask a question for a speaker. Perfect. Well, thanks again for your time and ideas. This has been great. My question is sort of in response to that independent policy setting board that you had mentioned, Rob. Um, from my seat, it seems like these organizations, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, do have strong policies nominally, but they seem to be enforced 
kind of at will and at random. And if you want to take that route, you know, it's seemingly one direction. So I'm curious how sort of that, that policy setting would differ from what already exists and, and really the enforcement aspect. Thanks. Sure. So the way I would envision it is you have to differentiate between sort of implementation and overarching policy. The implementation obviously can't be up to the government. There's, you know, posts coming up, you know, a hundred a second, you know, so you know, there's no way government could ever manage that. You have to have these nimble well-resourced companies, which is another reason why it's so important to have a few big companies because they have the capabilities to do this. But my point is these companies, in many cases, they don't know what the right answer is. Should they take down Trump or not? And I, that's where I agree with Frank. I don't think companies should be in that position. I don't think they want to be in that position. But somebody's got to answer that question. And I think we can answer that. I think we can, we can to me, there ought to be, there, there should be a way for a group of experts and luminaries to get together and say, these are the general boundaries and frameworks we think should be there. And then let the companies then implement that in the way they can. And I agree with Frank, by the way, I think one of the main, one of the most important things these companies can and should do, and they're not doing enough of, is they need to be more transparent. As I mentioned, I'm on the, this content advisory board at TikTok. And that's something TikTok has been, I don't, I'm not just mentioning them, it's just I happen to know them. They're, they're working on that a lot, and I know the other companies are. So I, I think transparent, more transparency about how they do the, make these decisions on content is, is something they should have been doing long ago, and it, it's come back to bite them a little bit, so. Um, so next we're gonna go, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, next we're gonna go to James Austin from SMU. And so this, this question actually kind of ties in with like that nimbleness and a nimbleness comment that you had earlier, Rob, but this is, this can also be directed at both of you. Um, and, and my question is, is, could there be an argument that the free market will eventually solve these problems themselves with time? You know, that is that firms like the size of Amazon or Facebook or Google um, eventually become so large and diversified that they ultimately lack the agility to solve the problems the best, uh, that they'll eventually be supplanted by startup firms like they once were themselves? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at IBM, for this great book by James Cortada, I think it's just called IBM, um, that is very clear that IBM just lost its aggressiveness, partly because of antitrust, but it just became too bureaucratic and it couldn't adapt fast enough. And as technology changed, they were left behind. I think it's certainly possible that you could imagine some kind of new technology coming about, like, for example, um, um, you know, blockchain technology that would just say Facebook doesn't exist anymore. It's totally peer to peer. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not a computer scientist, but it seems it seems likely. Uh, I think in 30 years, we probably will see a, a lot fewer of these companies. It, what you should remember is back in the late 90s and early 2000s, people were talking about the ongoing and in, in unsust, you know the and ongo, on, ongoing and you know an unstoppable Walmart monopoly nobody could stop Walmart except Walmart they were the only company that could stop themselves having said all that I'm sympathetic to Frank's point though you know as Kane said in the long run we're all dead but in the in the interim a lot of things can happen that we should be careful and concerned about so I agree with you in the long run that there's discipline but in the short run we need something I think a little more yeah, I think one of the other problems that a lot of the uh, kind of newer antitrust uh, advocates have been pointing to is, you know, this one form of exclusionary behavior. These companies are so big and rich that if they see a potential, uh, you know, rival on the horizon, they just buy it. Uh, so between them, uh, Facebook and Google had bought uh, several hundred startups uh, over the last five years. Uh, and this has come out in some of the congressional testimony that, you know, there's a email from Mark Zuckerberg basically laying this all out on the line said, you know, company X uh, looks like it could eventually eat into our market. So we better buy it. Uh, and one of the ideas, you know, that's out there is to uh, put limits on their ability to simply buy potential competitors because you do want them eventually to be replaced by, you know, an upstart that's got better technology. All right, gentlemen, um, if you all have any sort of closing thoughts, I'd love to go to Frank first, and then we'll finish with Rob, and that will conclude our program this evening. Well, I'd just like to say that in, uh, <laughs> in honor of the Adam Smith Society, I do think that, you know, the middleware solution is uh, a market-based solution. I mean, 
you are uh, not going to, I mean, it will require a regulatory environment, that's correct. But the essential decision about um, curating political speech on the internet is not going to be left up to a government agency. It is going to be left up to a competitive layer uh, of companies that give people a lot of choice in uh, how they uh, uh, choose the algorithms that determine what they see on the internet. Uh, and I'm the first to admit that we don't have a clear business model. That's something we're looking into at the moment about how to make this uh, actually viable. Uh, but I do think that if you don't like government regulation, uh, this is an idea to take seriously because it is dependent on uh, competition rather than one hierarchical authority deciding on what's good for everybody. Yeah, I think there's a third, as, as Bill Clinton used to say, there's a third way between uh, this and that. And the third way to me is, is sort of self-regulation that's guided by a societal set of norms. And I think that's the best answer here. By the way, to say that this is a market-based solution, it's a little bit like uh, saying that the 96 Telecom Act was a market-based solution. Um, 90, for those of you who don't know what the 96 Telecom Act was, it was had the genius of saying that long distance is this really important thing. I'm sorry, that local telephone service is this really important thing and we need more competition in it. Uh, anybody even use a telephone anymore? I mean, uh, so anyway, so what it did, it forced companies with a regulatory mandate, including pricing. So you had to unbundle all of your network elements. You had to have a price for it. Then competitors could come in. And this was called a market-based solution. It was anything but a market-based solution. It led to the catastrophe of uh, Lucent going out of business because they funded all these crazy firms that ended up going out of business because it was a completely unsustainable model. And what happened was instead of that was we had the rise of cellular, we had the rise of uh, VOI voice over internet protocol, we had the rise of cable voice. So we, technology and the markets took care of that problem. So I don't see this as a market-based solution. I see it as a regulatory solution that would infose and, in, and, and put into the market some middleware competitors who would siphon off needed money that would either mean, by the way, the, this, this money is not unlimited. So the idea that there'd be more money in, in the pool because of this, I don't buy. There's a limited amount of money in this sort of internet free pool. If they're gonna get more of it, it means that Amazon, TikTok, maybe not Amazon, TikTok, Google, Facebook are gonna get less. And by definition, that means they're gonna spend a lot less on R&D and other things like that. So I, I see it a little bit more like it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a fixed pie that we're just gonna split up. It's not gonna grow anything. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you, Steve, for leading us in the conversation this evening, and to all of our members for joining today. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks you. all.